Good afternoon. Uh, today is my great pleasure to introduce distinguished biochemist, a friend, Professor Wang Xiaodong. Xiaodong uh, obtained his bachelor degree from the Normal University, Beijing Normal University in 1984. Then he went to the US through the Chinese and United States Molecular Body Biochemical Exchange Program, known as CASPI. Then he obtained his the PhD degree from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in the 1991. Then he did his postdoctoral training with the Nobel laureates, Joe Gosling and Mark Brown, and also in the UT Southwestern. <clears throat> And then in 1995, he became an assistant professor um, in the Emory University. Just one year later, he moved back to UT Southwestern as an assistant professor in 1996, and quickly became an uh, investigator of Harvey Hughes Medical Institute in 1997. He was rapidly promote to full professor, and uh, George McGregor, distinguished chair professor in 2001. Only five, take five years from since professor to <laughs> chair professor. Currently, he's a director of the National Institute, Institute of Biological Sciences in Beijing, and also chair professor of the Tsinghua. Xiaodong is a world-renowned world expert on program cell deaths. If for students here, you ever learn cell biology, you know him, his work very well. He has made many seminal contributions to the program cell deaths by, by, by chemically identify key components, define the functions, including southern chrome C, and uh, apophysum, um, apoph1, and etc. You will learn more in his lecture. Because of his outstanding accomplishment, he was elected to the member of the Nation, National Academy of Science in the US in 2004. And later, it's a become foreign member of Chinese economy of sciences. In addition, he won many prestigious international awards. I uh, here I name, name a few. The Kim Fazo International Prize in the Medicine, Shaw Prize in the Love Science and the Medicine, reached Lonsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences, and the Herkman Award from the Welsh Foundation and Eli, Eli Lilly Award from the American Chemical Society. Xiaodong is the great academic leader. In 2004, he, uh, he, uh, he founded National Institute of Biological Sciences, served as a founding director of the institute. And the remains in, in, director until now. With his leadership and the vision, and uh, the institute become the top research institute in China, and one of the best in the world. Prof. Uh, Xiaodong is also success, successful entrepreneur. He's one of the founders by tech company, Belgian. Um, now, market worth over 25 billion. US dollars. And it, he also found a few other uh, biotech companies as well. You know, Prof. Wang also is the wonderful mentor for his PhD students and a postdoc fellow. Many of his the trainee has the in, uh, have obtained independent positions in, in China, US, and other countries. You know, another thing I should want to mention here, he's also a marathon runner. 
So that's one you want to be successful. You know, maybe test your ability to run long distance. Um, actually, Purpose One has been the friend of HKUSD and served as an advisor, scientific advisor for School of Science for a long time. Um, tomorrow, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I can make an announcement. He will obtain his honorary PhD degree from HKUST. Uh, congratulations. He will become a HKUST alumnus. Welcome to the USD family. Now uh, leave the podium to Xiaodong, and he will deliver a lecture program cell death in the organ specific aging. Welcome to the USD. Thank you, Professor Xie. And it was a way over the generous introduction. Um, now I have to live up to this. <laughs> um, still, uh, you know, first thank you for coming to this lecture. And uh, I have been to this, I, I was in this campus actually many years ago. Um, I always felt like I'm somehow connected. Um, when Paul Zhu was president, you know, I visited him a couple of times in here. Um, and then, you know, I know your president, Nancy, for a long time. And we know each other's science for a long time. I feel like we grew up together. Um, in any case, uh, it's truly a pleasure. Uh, I just realized that it, this, is, this is the first academic visit I had since pandemics. Um, you know, have, have been stuck in Beijing and finally I get out, but now I just learned I can no longer go back. <laughs> uh, so I've been wandering for a while. Um, but in any case, I think science, life goes on, science goes on. Um, I'm going to share with you, I would like to share with you um, a, a scientific uh, story and the scientific direction you know, our lab has been taking you know, in the last uh, seven, eight years. Um, you know, this is not by design. Actually, the, how, what gets us into this is total serendipity. But uh, as, the, as the project progress, you know, it's looks like more and more fitting. Uh, first of all, you know, I'm getting up in ages, um, and the study aging um, become more time urgent, um, has more time urgency. Um, and also, uh, as I grow up older and older, uh, especially since I pick up long distance running, I'm become much more patient. Um, I know to run a marathon, um, you just have to pace yourself. This is, the, this is the key, this is the secret. You just cannot run too far, you get too fast, you know, early on. Um, so the, the aging research is perfectly fine for scientists like myself at this stage of my career. Um, study aging, by definition, you cannot run too fast. Uh, every experiment take time because the animal needs age, need to age. Um, in any case, um, let's get started. So, um, as the team says, you know, my lab has been uh, has been studying. As team mentioned, you know, my lab has been studied program cell death. Uh, we started with apoptosis. It's one as as we learned you know, previously, you know, like apoptosis is the only form of program cell death. As the field started to progress, and you, you, you will learn more and more about you know, many different forms of program cell death. And apoptosis is just one of the, one of the forms. Um, just to get everybody up to the same page, and also give you some contrast what other form of cell, program cell death looks like, I'm just going to show you a, a video of what apoptosis looks like. 
you know, these are cultured cell on a petri dish. And uh, since we know apoptosis very well, and we are able to engineer these cells so we can specifically induce them to undergo apoptosis. And this is what they look like. They detach from the dish and they undergo this violent dance, so-called, so and they break into all these membrane-bound vesicles. And as you see, when the cell die of apoptosis, their cellular content never leak out. So it's not inflammatory, and uh, it's so-called quiet cell death. That's the reason for every day, you know, we have billions of cells in our body die of apoptosis, we never feel it. Um, if we run into the soccer field and get kicked by the uh, opponent, and uh, you, s you start to feel pain and swelling and e almost immediately because your cell died from physical injury. And that is a different form of cell death that is called the necrosis. You know, the, in that form of cell death, the cell membrane will break down, cellular content leak out, and you start to get inflammation response. And for, also for many years, we always thought apoptosis is programmed, necrosis is accidental. But as we learn more, um, and we also realize necrosis can also be programmed. I'm going to show you in a few slides. <clears throat> so for the, the field in the last few decades um, has basically mapped out um, the pathways, the biochemical pathways of apoptosis. And I am not want you to you know, remember all the details about this pathway. I just want to, uh, to uh, remind you that, as we know now, uh, the cell undergo apoptosis because they have this intracellular protease called the caspase, uh, especially called the caspase 3 and 7. These protease exist in the living cells as a zymogen. They are, they are inactive form. And when apoptosis starts, these proteases become activated, and they start to cleave many important intracellular substrates. And these cleavage give, up, give this morphological changes, as I show you in the video. Um, and for apoptosis, biochemical pathway of apoptosis is basically uh, to figure out how these caspase that exist in the living cells as the inactive zymogen, they become activated when the cell decides to undergo apoptosis. And as we know now, um, clearly, I'm going to show you later, this is, a total, this is clearly not a completed, complete picture, that we have two ways of activate a caspase. You know, one is extrinsic pathway that is uh, triggered by the signal from cytokines, they call the cell death family of cytokines, include, uh, exempted, exempted by the tumor necrosis factor, TNF alpha. And these act cytokines bound to its receptor will, re will result in a protein complex, including caspase 8, in the, at the cytoplasmic side of the receptor. And once these complex start formed, we will also include FADD and RIP1, the caspase 8 will become active. And the active caspase 8 will cleave caspase 3 and 7, leads to the apoptosis. And in addition to extracentric pathway, this caspase activation could also be initiated from the intracellular stimuli, such as DNA damage, uh, excessive DNA damage. And these stimuli will act on a BCL2 family of proteins that consists of two flavors, the BCL2, which is anti-cell death, and they will bound to the protein called BACs. And these BACs, once they are freed from the BCL2, they can punch in holes on outer membrane of mitochondria, result in releasing of protein like cytochrome C and a smack from the mitochondria, intermembrane space. And these proteins, once get out of mitochondria, will drive the activation of caspase 9, also leading to the activation of caspase 307. Or the released protein SMAC will bound to intracellular caspase inhibitors called IAPs. And to remove the inhibition of these IAPs on the caspase activity. 
So as you as you see, the this is a, is a, is a well designed almost the circuits that has you know the 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 the, the initiator has the break has the anti break and, and and the perfectly good circuits that one cell decides to check out this world and the circuits become activated and caspase activated the cell die by apoptosis. So uh, <clears throat> the story I'm going to tell you initiated from the, this, this particular study in the um, this is a collaborative study between you know my lab and Yi Gongxi's lab when he was still at Princeton that their lab solved the co-crystal structure of SMAC with this IAP uh, uh, domain, a bonding domain. And the structure itself is actually spectacular. And particularly, uh, we realized the, the, the SMAC bound to IAP only through these four amino, N-terminal four amino acid as AVPI. And even the N-terminal four amino acid the true contributors for the bonding affinity is this first alanine, which is only generated when the N-terminal mitochondrial targeting sequence of SMAC get cleaved off and exposed. And uh, also the uh, C-terminal isoleucine, which is provided hydrophobic interaction. The side chains of these amino acid valine, proline are actually not required for bonding, so they can they can sub be subjected to many kind of modifications. So based on these studies, we collaborated with some chemists um, and designed small molecules that try to mimic these four amino acids we call the SMAC mimetics. And this is how we designed it. The N-terminal alanine, and you cannot leave it exposed because if you leave it exposed, it can be used quickly degraded. So you need to protect the small the same terminal alanine, you can put a methyl, methyl group in front. And the C-terminal, because it's, all, it's, uh, it's uh, provided hydrophobic interaction, you can replace the isoleucine with the hydrophobic moiety of a chemical compound. And uh, you can even uh, uh, replace this, this uh, peptide bond, so make it more stable at the C-terminal as well. What's really remarkable is we can even link with a linker at the, the uh, side chain of valine to make a dimer. Because the SMAC protein itself, native protein is a dimer. So by, by connect the valine, you can even link it with, with protein as well, it doesn't matter, to make the dimer which is function just as the native protein, uh, just as well as native protein. But what's Different than native proteins, native protein, when it's translated in the cytosol, needs to be transported into the mitochondria. And only when it's getting into the mitochondria, the N terminal peptide signal peptide will be cleaved, then the protein will be active. In the cytosol, with the signaling peptide uncleaved, SMAC protein is not functional because it cannot fit into this bonding groove. But for the small molecule, it will be readily penetrated the cell, and they don't go to mitochondria, they go to the cytosol to immediately take out all the IAPs. So in theory, it will make the cell much more sensitive to any apoptotic stimuli. Um, uh, truth be told that this strategy now is, is being advanced to, to the registration trials uh, for uh, head and neck uh, cancer uh, coupled with radiation. So, you know, radiation is to induce apoptosis, and the SMAC mimetics was to remove, um, to remove the inhibition of IAPs. So, looks like head and neck combination with radiation will be the first indication the SMAC mimetic will be proved. And the other trial, which is very, also very interesting, is people use SMAC mimetics to try for chronic uh, hepatitis. You know, chronic hepatitis B infection, as you all know, is uh, there are many people get infected and they have, they have a risk for develop cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis as well as liver, can, liver ca cancer. 
and they use this mathematics, happen to be the cell get infected and is more sensitive to the smack mathematics induced apoptosis. So th this trial is also advanced you know, into, re into registration trials. So SMAC, we often you know, trying to tell students that sometimes you know, we're working long hours in the lab, we got lost, why are we here? Um, you know, how, I got a question, you know, how we balance life work balance? Um, and is there real value that for what we do every day in the benches, you know, pumping solution into different tubes? Um, you know, I just, you know, smack mathematics is a, is, is a good, is a story, is a good story. Because, you know, before we don't even know this protein exists, and we discovered the protein, we discovered how it works, and then we, you know, to try to extract value by know from what we know how it works, and then we make mimics that now in advanced trials for cancer and the chronic hepatitis hepatitis B, you know, both uh, you know major you know unmet medical needs. So, but we are not talking about you know how to use it. Uh, but for uh, SMAC mathematics, when we first designed it, it's become a great two molecules. And we, start, we are start to play with it and by give to all sort of different cell lines and see what it will do. And this will be a typical experiment. You know, like in this cells, which cell lines, which is derived from human pancreatic cancer, you know, we give the cells ting F alpha, and we are not able to kill the cells because the cells, the, 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 the circus is not on because you have IEPs. And we give them smack mimetics, we take out the IEPs, it's not going to kill the cell because they don't have a apoptotic stimuli. But we put together within hours, you know, more than 80% of the cells are die by apoptosis because we know it's apoptosis. We can totally block the cell death by adding a small molecule called the ZVAD, which is a pancaspase inhibitor. So exactly like the diagram predict, like the textbook predict, you know, like it's good, we can write it up, write a paper, very nice. But as science always, always do to you, is to throw you a curveball. That's when the things get start getting interesting. And we did the same experiments on a different cell lines. This is HD29 cell line, which is a colon, is derived from human colon cancer. And in this cell lines, you know, we treat same TNF alpha, magmatics, just like you know, pancreatic cells is, is the same, it doesn't do much. But what was su surprise, surprise or not surprise, you know, we put TNF alpha and magmatics, we only killed this much cells roughly about 50% of the cells, which is not surprising because some cells are response to particular stimuli better than others. What's really surprising was when we add ZVAD, caspase inhibitor, we not only didn't block the, the, what's, what's get killed, the 50% cell killed, we got much more cell killing as if the, the caspase inhibitor promote this form of cell death. The caspase is anti-death, so which is totally different than what, I, what apoptosis study has been telling us. So this form of cell death clearly is not apoptosis because it doesn't require caspase. Um, it's actually require caspase inhibition. But it's also programmed because they need TNF, they need smac -mimetics. So this is a very different form of cell death. And uh, let's look at it, what does it look like of this form of cell death? Morphologically. This is the same HeLa cells. They are busted like a popcorn. So they are very different than apoptosis. And they, they, they are busted 
because then their memory is all broken down, and the cellular content is, is all going to leak out. So this is the necrosis, but it's programmed necrosis. And uh, also nowadays, you know, people call it necroptosis. You know, it's, a, it's like apoptosis, but it's a program. So clearly, this is very different than apoptosis. So we spent uh, since uh, 2000 and, and, and seven when we first noticed this phenomena, and by the time of 2012, and we basically, uh, 2014, you know, we spent like seven years, and we, we, we also, uh, you know, deconvoluted this biochemical pathway of this form of cell death, and which is summarized here. And this form of cell death <coughs> is able to receive stimuli. This is only a partial list, actually, like TNF alpha, uh, 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 the, the, the cell death receptors, and they also receive signal from TOLAC receptors. And many of you know, TOLAC receptor is an important part of innate immunity. It's when the bacteria, uh, a virus, in fact, our body, the TOLAC receptor is one of the early warning systems that sends them and, and start triggering the immune response. And also, there is a molecule called the dye that, di that directly sensing the, the, the the, the fragments of uh, intracellular, uh, they call the Z form of RNA, and which is, will, this will be transcribed from particular virus genome. So this pathway is antimicrobial. Anti it's antiviral, it's antibacterial. So it's in, involved in the immune system. And uh, <clears throat> the activation of these, you know, with Downstream of these signals, there are two key components for this pathway. One is this called RIP3 uh, for receptor interacting protein kinase 3. Remember this name. I'm going to say a lot about this. And a substrate called MLKL. MLKL stands for mixed lineage kinase domain like protein. So just from the name, it looks like a kinase but it's not a real kinase, so it's a pseudokinase. It has a kinase-like domain protein. And it's, we realize the RIP3 kinase and the MLKL kinase-like can form stable dimers, and the MLKL is a substrate for RIP3. And the, we map the phosphorylation size, and we also develop monoclonal antibodies that specifically recognize this phosphorylation size. This is important because now we can use this antibody to specifically go to different tissues to probe when and where this pathway is on. For example, like showed in the, in the, in the uh, bottom part of the slides, this is uh, uh, immunohistochemical staining of a liver sample biopsy from the patients who suffered drug-induced acute liver failure. Um, you know, in Chinese, it's called chi uh, cuo um, These people have suffered from a, a, a acute liver failure, they get rushed to the hospital. And uh, sometimes they, are, they, they, are, they, they took a biopsy. And uh, before, nobody knows how this thing happens. And when we stained this liver biopsy sample with this particular antibody recognized the phospho MLKL signal, you see this massive sig staining signal. And we also checked the biopsy from some liver transplants, and we never see this thing, the healthy liver transplant. And uh, RIP3 turns out is also phosphorylated by a particular phosphorylation event, either by another upstream kinase called RIP1, and RIP1 is activated by directly recruited to these receptors. And they can also be activated in a RIP1 independent fashion by a protein called a TRIF, and which is receiving signal from TOLAC receptors. So the upstream signal could be diverse, you know, like many signaling, signaling events, upstream could be diverse, so they can receive different type of signals, but converging on the core pathway is phosphorus, 
RIP3 and MLKL. And MLKL, once they are activated, they can directly go to the membrane and break the membrane and cause necrosis, and cause the popping of the cell you just saw. <clears throat> and I mentioned before, you know, this pathway clearly is involved in um, anti antimicrobial infections. So the knockout of these two genes, RIP3 and MLKL, as I'll show you later, does not affect the development as well as fertility of these animals. So they look normal if you don't challenge them with a virus infection or bacterial infection. So uh, this is actually one of the experiments that uh, completely come out, come out of your know, serendipity. It is serendipity because nobody will, will, ra will raise their mouse at four, uh, up to 14 months because you need to pay the, 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 the bills for the housing these animals. And usually you do the experiments, you get rid of them, and sometimes you, you urge your student and postdoc to get rid of them, um, and you don't keep them beyond, let's say, five months. And uh, this story I'm going to share with you actually has a very tragic beginning. <laughs> the reason we, keep, we, we have to keep the animal for long is because the experiments we are planning to do was when a student was already in the third year of her graduate career, and suddenly we saw in one of the prominent journals there is a paper who reported the, the, the experiment, the, the, the results of experiments we are just we we, we planned to do, and uh, and we got most of the results and. But we saw their publication, and their, their conclusion is very consistent with what we saw. So this is, will be the worst nightmare of any graduate student, that in the, fourth, in the third or fourth year of your graduate career, and you just found what your project has just been published in one of the prominent journals. So what do you do? Um, so in our story, in, in our case, you know, I, I can, tell you that we end up with a happy ending. Um, but uh, uh, the story certainly takes its turns. You know, that when we saw this, we clearly you know, have a big panic moment in the lab. But in order to calm down the student, I said, I carefully read the paper, I said, they just show the, the, the effects of RIP3, you, has RIP3 or not. But they didn't let the animal live long enough to show whether they have an impact on the longevity. So why don't you grow, let, you know, raise and leave the animal longer, and you don't have to do a whole lot. You can take a vacation and, and let the animal, just let the animal, see, let's see whether we can see the impact really has longevity. And a few months later, I forgot about the project. And, then, <laughs> uh, and uh, she come in and says, these animals look very strange. I said, what happened? She said, these animals, the RIP3 knockout animals, looks very young. And here is what, what she saw. And this is 18 old months old mouse. 18 year old, year old mouse, so I would say, close to human 70. And, uh, these animals, just like humans, when they reach to that age, many of them become obese. And it's, it's very, you know, cross the board phenomena. But these especially knock animals look lean. And uh, they just look like they are still young. Um, here is the statistically, um, you know, the cross the board, you know, looks lean. But is there, there will be many possibilities why animal looks lean. And, uh, Let's see what else they look different. And then we realize the biggest difference is in this particular organ called seminal vesicles. So seminal vesicle is a part of the male reproductive system. And it's a gland. You know, I'm going to explain to you what the seminal vesicle really is. 
and it's it's a gland, so it's a, it's a secretive gland. It's, it's has a, uh, uh, it's a has has epithelium. It's like a bag and with liquid inside. And uh, it's it's known. It's well known when mouse grow older, their seminal vesicles will become larger, and we don't know why they become larger. So we saw this some kind of a compensatory growth like a human prostates. You know, when the old men get old, they have a bigger prostate. And uh, um, we, we don't know why they get a bigger prostate, because they probably have this compensatory growth. Um, you know, it's just the thought. Um, but the mouse prostate, they don't get larger. But their seminal vesicles become larger. Um, this is the statistics. And, uh, but the RIP3 and MLK knockouts, they don't get larger. And they are still looks relatively small, like they were young. Um, let me ex explain what a seminal uh, vesicle is. Uh, this is a, a diagram of a male reproductive system of a mouse. And uh, here is the most important part of the male reproductive system, is testes. And, uh, and we, the, the reason is testes is where the sperm is generated. And when they generate it, they will transfer, transferred and stored in this epididymis. Until ejaculation, the sperm will travel through this tube, then mixed with the liquid secreted from the seminal vesicles. This is the part of the reproductive system become larger when the mouse gets older. And also mixed with this another well-known uh, secretive gland, uh, prostate, and uh, become a semen that get ejected out of the system. So you look at the reproductive system, you clearly realize the most important part has to be the testes, and the rest of them are just, you know, greasy oils. Um, so let's look at what happened to their testes. And before I show you the actual data, I just want to let you get familiar with what testes is really looks like. The testes is full of these units called seminiferous tubules. These are the units of testes. A testes will consist many of these units. And these units have this basal lamina as a membrane, which isolate testes from the bloodstream. So testes is just like a brain. It has a barrier. It's just like a blood-brain barrier. It has a testes blood barrier. So it's not communicated with the blood. So like they say, what happened in Vegas stay in Vegas is what happened in testes stay in testes, which has become very important. Um, so it, within the testes, they have these two major cell types. You know, one is spermogonia, which are the uh, uh, stem cells you know, for sperm genesis. And they undergo meiosis to generate immature sperm, which will migrate into the central lumen part uh, uh, of the uh, 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 seminicid tubules, which will be you know, transferred and stored in epididymis. Um, so in addition to spermogonia, they also have these supporting cells called the satori cells, satori cells. Um, and outside the, the, the uh, uh, seminiferous tubules, and you will have hormonal producing cells called Leydig cells. And of course, they also have you know, immune cells, myeloid, etc. This is what it looks like when you do a cross-section of the testes, a wild type as well as RIP3 and MLK knockouts. And you will see, in a, this is like um, uh, old testes, um, like 18 months old testes. And you see in a wild type, you already see the seminiferous tubules, which looks empty. And you see this basal membranes of seminiferous tubules. But in RIP3 knockout and MLK knockout, even the mouse at the same age, you see the thickness of these cell layers of seminiferous tubules. 
And you also see mature sperms in the lumen of the seminiscent tubules. And you don't see many like this wide open uh, seminiscent tubules like in wild type animals. So we also remember we have monochrome antibodies that specifically recognize the fossil MLKL indicating the activation of the pathway. So we also stained, using this antibody to stain, the four months and 18 months old mouse testes. As you see here, as in wild type animal, at four months, you don't see any signal. But when the mouse reached 18 months, you start to see these prominent signals at these cell layers that in, that in the surrounding region of the seminiscent tubules, indicating there are this form of cell death happening in these cells, including, I don't have time to show the actual data, in both Satoli cells at the sperm gonias, there's activation of this program cell death, and which is, may contribute to the, uh, to the opening up of these vacuums. Um, but in RIP3 knockout, you don't see it, and clearly you, know, you see the, the normal looking uh, <coughs> seminiferous tubules. And we also uh, got a sample, you know, work with uh, uh, the people in the study the, doing the surgeons doing the prostate cancer surgery. And we also get some samples from um, testes biopsies from old men who suffer from prostate cancer. In prostate cancer, the, you know, the treatment sometimes is to take out the testes because prostate cancer need androgen to grow. And we also get valves, you know, the testes samples from young people who suffer from testes, they call the testes torso, meaning part of one side of the testes get physically injured. And uh, you have to take them out. If you don't take that part of it out, you, they become necrotic. Necrotic, it also affect the health of the other side of the testes. So then you can get a sample from young and old uh, testes of men. And uh, clearly you see that in a young man, 30 years old, and you, don't, you see this just like a young mouse. This is seminiscent tubules, and you see the, the thick cell layers. But the old man, like 80 years old, and in many of these seminiscent tubules, it looks dilated, and the cell becomes sp sparse. And, uh, you have this big vacuous in the middle. And if you stain with phosphor antibody, MLK antibody, you, know, you pick up these positive signals in the old man, but not the young man. So it looks to us this pathway is convert, evolutionally conserved between man and mouse. Remember, I didn't say mammals. <laughs> Because in some mammals, this pathway is not conserved, um, which is an interesting this topic for another day. And so, so far, I, I showed you the, the, the animal without rip 3 or MLK, when they, get, when they grow old, uh, males, and uh, they look young. They are physically look young. Their testes look young. Also, I didn't show you the testosterone level. Their testosterone level also remain high. But then the question you often ask, can they still do it? So meaning that can they still produce progeny? And in mouse, we actually can do the experiment to test it. So we give the 16 months old uh, male mouse, wild type rip 3 knockout, MLK knockout, two female 10 weeks old, young female mouse, and we see whether they can still get them pregnant. Um, and then we do the, the, the data collection and statistics. So for 16 months old wild type animals, only 14, three out of 14 can still reproduce. But for RIP3 knockouts and MLK knockouts, almost 80% can still produce versus wild type, which is already down to 20%. When they are young, almost 100% of them can reproduce. So clearly, um, you know, they not only look young, they, they can act, 
also functional as a young animal. But what's the catch? You have to ask, what's the catch? The catch is the babies they produce, which they don't supposed to, almost all of them has birth defects. So which reminded us why two things. First is clearly the testis aging is programmed. And its needs and its service purpose. It's the purpose looks like is to get rid of the old DNA actively from the gene pool. To prevent, you know, as, as you all know, the old DNA will accumulate mutations. And uh, the, this program triggers the elimination of old DNA from pr to prevent them from pr pr to get into the gene pool. If they do, they will produce these defective offsprings. So we, we believe that is an evolutionary advantage to have this programmed organ-specific organ -specific programmed aging. Then the question becomes, is this sex dependent? What, what about the females? So, I'm going to switch gear a little bit and tell you the story about females. Uh, just to give you a warning, and as you may already know, the, first of all, female is very different than male, is totally different than male, and the female is much more sophisticated. Um, so let's look at the ovary uh, from the female mouse. Uh, this is a young ovary of wild type, RIP3 knockouts, and MLK knockouts. And you don't see much difference. And uh, these vacuoles are follicles. The, when follicle, when the egg start to mature, they grow into this mature egg, different stage of mature egg follicles. And uh, then, as you, many of you know, the, 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 when the time to uh, overlating, uh, these egg, the, the cells surrounding the egg, which called um, granulosa, the granular cells, will die and, and spill out the egg, and which will you know, um, pass through and get, get if, if the animal get a chance to, be, to meet the male, they, they get fertilized. And you see all these you know, eggs. But at the 14 months, you see the wild type, you know, as well as the MLKL knockouts, you don't see much egg follicle. You know, first of all, the, the, the organ become, you know, shrink, becomes smaller, and they look much more fibrotic, filled with you know, the, 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 the collagens and, and fibrin. But for the RIP3 knockouts, they look a little bit different. And you still see quite a few healthy looking follicles. And uh, not just the, 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 the follicles, um, uh, this is, this is the, the, the quantification. Uh, um, this is not like the male, sper you know, male testes that 14 months old, 18 months old, they all look almost totally young. And they still have a you know, major drop. But the relative speaking, the wild type and MLK knockouts has a much bigger drop. These are the, horm the, the, the estrogen level, um, um, E2. And uh, clearly, you see from four months to 14 months, you, know, you will see statistically drop, both wild type and uh, as, uh, uh, as well as uh, MLK knockouts. But you look at RIP3 knockouts, their drop is not obvious. So they seem to maintain their, test, test, their, their estrogen level. Then how about the reproductivity? And uh, again, this time we give every female a stud male, a young stud male, uh, 10 weeks old. 
and we see whether the female can get pregnant. You see, at four months of age, all these animals, 20 out of 20, can all get pregnant. At 14 months, the wild type, only 23% can still get pregnant. But RIP3 knockout, at the same age, almost still 70% can still get pregnant. MLK knockouts, again, you know, down to 25%. So obviously, the RIP3 knockout animal has more egg follicle, and they can still have you know, many of the high percentage, 70% of them can still have pups, even when they are 14 months old. So um, again, you probably can guess, all of, them, all of these pups are not healthy. So we believe in female, um, the programmed, uh, the programmed uh, um, aging also exist, also serve the same function. But the question become, our ovary is, is more complicated. What is truly being triggered here? What is the signal, that aging signal is being sensed here? So let me tell you the rest of the story. Um, we also, again, we also tested the, the, the reproductive uh, longevity. You know, the, if you don't know what that means, is we keep giving different age female young start, and we measure at what time they, they're no longer able to reproduce. So clearly, the, uh, the RIP3 knockouts is, is, is significantly longer than well type. Um, so, to figure out what RIP3, RIP first of all, is unique, MLKL doesn't play any role. So this is what we saw. And how RIP3 play a role here? And is that clearly not through this program necrosis pathway? And what pathway it goes through? So, first of all, we just checked the RIP3 expression in ovary. We did both Western blood as well as immunohistochemistry staining. And of different aged ovary. And f first of all, clearly, you see the RIP3 expression is bell-shaped. It is high in the beginning, this is two weeks old mouse, and it get lower when the mouse in becomes sexually mature, and then it become higher again when they start getting old. So it's bell-shaped. But when we look at where they express, and they look, they obviously look different. One, when the mouse was young, you know, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks old, you see it's expressed in the granulus, the surrounding leg. That's why you see all these rings. You know, when the egg follicle develop, you know, they first from primordial egg, which is like the small clumps, then they, when they start to ex develop, these are granular cells that are surrounding the, the, the egg. And the, then the egg starts to develop into fully mature follicles when they intersexually uh, mature. And you see the very nicely stain outside the ring. And here is, you know, more clear. But when the animal gets old, let's say four months, you start seeing more and more these clumps. And in the end of the day, at 14 months, they, they become all become these clumps. And these clumps are no longer co-localized with the hair, with the egg follicle. You see, before they always with the rings with the self with the follicles. Then at eight months, you see all these clumps. As this here is the, fo here, the egg follicle is no longer with the with the follicle. So, what these this looks like? There are two waves of RIP3 expression. The first wave 
is is the one with all the the, the the granular cells that surrounding the egg. And the second wave, it seems to come out of nowhere. And it's, it's clumps into this, um, into this clumps in, 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 in the ovary. And uh, then we, what we did is for these you know, old uh, ovary like clumps, and we suspect this may be have cell death happening. And we stained with you know, many cell death markers, but we found active Caspi3 is perfectly co-localized you know, with, with the RIP3 signal. So here is, here is the um, um, quanti quantifi uh, quantification. And uh, looks like the RIP3 signal that later emerges induced apoptosis in ovary. And this is uh, not just, again, only happening in mouse. So we able to collaborate with the, the uh, doctors um, you know, in Beijing, um, study um, uh, this they called, um, I can never remember the name, uh, there is an ovary disease. They, they develop many uh, fibrosis, you know, in the ovary, and uh, then you know the, they 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 lost the, their estrogen level drops. You know, the women start growing uh, hairs on their face and and etc. And we we got a biopsy from these ovaries, and again we stained. Um, uh, active caspase 3 as well as RIP3. And we found, again, these clumps of caspase 3 is co-localized with this, active, this RIP3 signal. Here is the quantification. And the location um, the, uh, the location of these signals are in corpus albicans. And the, the corpus our beacons is just, I think it's, it's defined by its looks, right? It's, uh, they just look like, um, you know, bunk, it's, it's dead um, ovary follicle uh, remnant. Um, so looks like the, 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 the um, RIP3 has two waves, and the second wave um, is coincident, co-localized, co-resides with the active Caspi3. So then the question becomes, what really happened? So to dissect the biochemically, we, we cannot study ovary as an organ. We have to bring that, to break it down into a cell line. So we first, just get a cell lines, they call this KGN cells, which is a human cell lines derived from the egg granular cells that surround this ovary follicle. Um, and in these cells, uh, this cell actually doesn't express RIP3. But if we express RIP3 artificially with a dark inducible expression, and we showed Whenever we start, you know, expression uh, RIP3, and we see cell death, and the cell death is apoptosis because we, if we add ZVAD, which is caspase inhibitor, we can prevent the cell death, and we also add this programmed necrosis inhibitor. We we discovered we named NSA. This doesn't able to inhibit to affect. So this is all apoptosis. When you add, this is a RIP1 inhibitor doesn't affect. So whenever you inhibit the caspase, you see it's blocked, this form of cell death. So this form of cell death is apoptosis, but it's RIP3 dependent apoptosis. Remember, this is in the induction of RIP3. So how RIP3 is able to induce apoptosis, so which has become 
very interesting. Um, so um, then we start to look for different clues. And so we put, again, RIP3, tech inducible RIP3, in MCF7 cells. MCF7 cells is, a, is a from breast cancer. Again, it's, it's a, it's a estrogen-dependent de, uh, cell. And we also put in RIP3 into HeLa cells. A HeLa cell usually don't ex express RIP3. But if we put in, HeLa cell doesn't respond undergo this necrotic cell death either, programmed necrotic cell. But if we put RIP3 in, they can do it. So we put this RIP3, but they lack, remember, necrotic cell deaths need the induction of, you need addition of smagmatics and TNF alpha. By simply induction of RIP3 expression, does not kill HeLa cells, but it kill robustly MCF7 cells. Then we, the question become, same RIP3, they express in two different cell lines. They're all from female. One is cervical, one is breast. What different they look? Here is different. It looks like in MCF7 cell, you get multiple bands of RIP3. And in HeLa cells, you only get one band. So which telling us they may be phosphorylated in in MCS7 cells, and the phosphorylation is important for its function, for induced cell deaths. So we then go ahead and map the phosphorylation site. And uh, before I show you where is the phosphorylation site is, and whether the phosphorylation site is truly relevant, I also want to show you that we also did a IP experiments you know, from MCS7 cells, since we know Expression RIP3 will induce apoptosis. And uh, when we pull down the flag, which is tagged RIP3, and we not only, we, we pull down caspase A, we pull down fat, and we pull down RIP1. So it looks like the RIP3 in these MCS7 cells formed a caspase 8 activation complex that is also have FADD and RIP1. Um, and uh, if you, we add caspase inhibitor, we did in, prevented the activation of caspase 8, which seems to be happened in this complex. Is that true? They do form, if they do form this complex, internally from RIP3, they, they will require these components. What about we knock out these components? So we knock out RIP1, we knock out the caspase 8, we knock out fat, and we also knock out C-flip. C-flip is a caspase 8 inhibitor, which is, they look like caspase 8. They can also rec recruit to the caspase 8 side, but they don't have activated enzyme. So this is an inhibitor. So you knock out both RIP1, caspase 8, and fat. The cell is totally saved. These cells are no longer able to die, even you induce RIP3 expression. But you take out FLIP, it doesn't matter. In a matter of fact, the cell die faster, so which is consistent. That tells us that when RIP3 was expressed in MCS7 cells, but remember, not in HeLa cells, they will form this caspase 8 activating complex. And they require all these components to activate cell death. So um, then the question becomes, if we take out FADD, do we also have an ovary phenotype? But the question is, you cannot take out the FADD. If you take out the FADD, the, the caspase 8 will, will uh, not be able to activate whole throughout the development. The caspase, even caspase, remember, the caspase 
especially CASP is it, is the inhibitor of this necrotic cell death. And you need to add a CASP inhibitor to induce this necrotic cell death. So same thing that if you don't have CASP is it, the mouse die pre, uh, uh, at embryonic stage, perinatally, uh, not perinatally, prenatally. The reason is this necrotic cell death happened you know, in long in the vascular system, so the animal wasn't able to develop. So in order to get mature animal to study their ovary, you need to same time knock out MLKL or RIP3. And uh, then you get fully survived animal. And we look at animal at 12 months old, and we uh, 11 months old. The reason we don't we need to keep them uh, to study them at a relatively young age, uh, 11 months instead of 14 months, because if you knock out this caspicid fat pathway, when the animal get old, they develop they, they develop this T cell lymphoma. So we cannot keep them too long. But at 11 months old, it's old enough. And for 12 of them, wild type and FADD MLKL double knockout, and we give them start male mouse. Wild type, only four out of 12 can still produce. But these fat MLKL double knockout, 10 out of 12 can still reproduce. Um, remember, MLKL knockout in animal doesn't affect their fertility whatsoever. Um, again, w the pup they are able to reproduce is not healthy. You know, same thing as rip three knockout. So <clears throat> here is come the model. We believe there is a, exists of a pathway of apoptotic pathway, intracellular apoptotic pathway that initiated from RIP3. And they require RIP1, FADD, and caspase 8 And this pathway actually been hinted before that you know, when Vishva Dixit from Genentech did one experiment, he made a knocking animal for RIP3 kinesthetic. And then he found the animal wouldn't be able to survive. And this mutant RIP3 actually bound FADD, RIP1, and the caspase 8 So he said this apparently activated this pathway. But they, they never know this pathway actually naturally happening. And it's naturally happening in ovary. I'm going to show you more. And it's naturally happening because we believe this RIP3 must have a special modification. And I showed you already that happened in FCF7 cells and, and in granular cells, but not in HeLa cells. And we just, want, we just need to map out the, the, the difference modification in these different two cells. And we know what happened in RIP3 to trigger this pathway. Um, to cut a long story short, and we found the, the, in RIP3, the serine 164 and the serine 165 has phos are phosphorylated. And we also developed the, the monoclonal antibody against this phosphorylated RIP3, as you see here. The wild type, if you express RIP3 in MCF7 cells, you pick up the signal by the antiphosphorylated RIP3 antibody. And uh, if you do mutant, you, you, you don't pick up the signal. And uh, you, with flag antibody, you don't see the upper ship of the RIP3 band. <clears throat> Here is in the granular cells. It's the same thing. Very clear. It's just like MCS7 cells. But in HeLa cells, you, you, it's very different. Here is the flag. So you express RIP3. In, in MCF7 cells, the uh, KGN cells, you see two bands. But in HeLa cells, you only see one band. So HeLa, and you use phospho, anti-phospho antibody, you only pick up signals from 
the cells that, and, and, that is able to undergo apoptosis, you are not able to pick up the signals from the cell unable to undergo apoptosis. So we realize this specific phosphorylation is a signal for apoptosis. And we also know this phosphorylation is due to autophosphorylation from RIP3. Um, so here is the, is the signal. But if it's autophosphorylation, what induced RIP3 expression? And what caused them to go undergo this autophosphorylation? So here is the answer. Before I show you the answer, now we have this antiphosphor RIP3 antibody. We go to the ovary of different age and probe it again. Remember, if we just do the RIP3, uh, uh, normal RIP3 antibody, we see this bell-shaped curve express high early, but it's all in the egg follicle, um, the, the, the surrounding egg follicle. And then the bell shape come back again in later life, and it's all clumps into this you know, unstructured place. Uh, but for phosphor RIP3 antibody, only pick up signal when the animal is old. So clearly, there are two forms of RIP3, and the one in the late life, RIP3, when expressed, they are phosphorylated. And uh, they, only, they don't pick up the, the, the follicle RIP3, they only pick up the slums of RIP3. Um, so here is we even use this antibody versus a transgenic animal, which is tagged with flag. So we are able to stain these two forms of RIP3 simultaneously. And we clearly see you know, these general RIP3 will still surround the follicles, but the clumps of these RIP3 um, at the corpus albicans, called the corpus region, uh, only the phosphor RIP3 is expressed. Um, <coughs> Then the question becomes, what signal that induced the second wave of RIP3? And then we start to look into the literature, and we realize it's been reported before. Phosphoglandin, uh, uh, phosphoglandin 2 alpha expressed in ovary. And look at as the ovary age, its level increased dramatically. And uh, we stained the RIP3 flag with prostaglandin 2 alpha receptor. And we found in a later stage, they co localize at corpus cell beacon. So it looks like uh, this tells us prostaglandin 2 alpha might be the signal for late stage RIP3. Is that true? Um, what we, to, to prove that, what we did was to use a, a, a proscanin to alpha analog, called a, that, uh, we call the DP, a DT. And in this experiments, we first induce over, overlation, uh, super overlation in animals to let them produce a lot of egg, to mature a lot of egg follicles. Then we inject DT, and, uh, and we look at what happens. Um, here is uh, uh, the staining of RIP3. And with DT injection, you see lots of RIP3 get induced. And uh, what's really interesting is, if you induce RIP3, this is not now in young animals. You induce RIP3, all RIP3, the RIP3 can be picked up by phosphor RIP3 antibody. Um, the level also increases. And this is due to prostaglandin pathway. The prostaglandin pathway induced RIP3 through the, the activate the ERK map K pathway. And for the because the time I didn't have a chance to uh, the time to show you, if we knock out prostaglandin 2 alpha, the animal looks fine. 
but they no longer have this phenotype. Um, and again, we showed that it's activate uh, caspase 8, this, pro this, this analog, um, using the immunohistochemistry. And we show this DT induce caspase uh, 8, uh, caspase 3 activation, active caspase 3 in wild type, but not in RIP3, and FADD, MLKL double knockout. Here is the quantification. So the, the prostaglandin is the, is the trigger, and uh, uh, this through RIP3, the FADD pathway. Here is the, my final summary, summary slides. I know I'm running slightly over time, and uh, because I want to give you a full story. Um, so for, we believe for the, the, the animal, um, in animals, not all organ are aged equally. The reproductive organ aged first. You know, this is elephant in the room. We already know that, right? Um, and uh, they age first because they aged through a program. But the male and the female are different. And uh, I'm not claiming it's a full story, but it's part of, it's, it start emerging as a story. Um, for males, um, it's through TNF farm, TNF farm lymph cytokines. Um, and we believe it's due to accumulative oxidative DNA damage from young to old. Once this, to a certain stage, they will activate of a kappa B pathway, remember what happened in the testes stay in the testes. And they will paracrine, generate paracrine signal and the triggered the, uh, the activation of a TNF family fan. And in the spermogonium and the Sertoli cells, there are very little caspase 8, almost non-detectable. So naturally, if you activate this pathway, you trigger necroptosis. And uh, with RIP3, MLKL RIP3, and uh, these are the specific phosphorylation uh, events, and uh, they cause the necroptosis of spermogonia stem cells. And uh, this is what causes aging of testes. And then there is secondary consequences, like the, the enlargement of, of seminal vesicles and the death of hormonal produced lindic cells. But for females, as the animal grow young to old, they accumulate these prostaglandin to alpha in the ovary, which is the inflammatory signals. The, inf the inflammation is caused aging, and this is very true here. In this case, the prostaglandin, when they accumulate, they activate the receptor through MAPK pathway, they induce the RIP3 expression. And in the, this is happening later in life in, in, in animals, and uh, they happen in the granular cells. And the induction of RIP3 will autophosphorylate itself, and then they form this apoptosis caspase 8 activating complex, and causing apoptosis of regular lieutenant cells of ovary. And that accelerated, you know, these are the nurturing cells, hormonal producing cells for the ovary. And uh, these cell deaths cause aging of the ovary, and in human, we call the menopause. Lastly, uh, I want to acknowledge the, the people who actually did the work. This is a graduate student um, whose project gets scooped. And uh, as, like I mentioned, uh, the whole story has a tragic beginning, but it ended up with a happy ending that switched all ma my major research uh, uh, direction of my lab from cell death now to organ specific aging. Um, I believe you know, this will take us quite a few years and extended my, not reproductive longevity, but my scientific longevity, you know, hopefully for a few more years. And of course, she graduated from the lab, got a postdoc position at the HMI 
lab at Stanford. Um, Li Dianrong is, a, is another uh, graduate student, um, clearly who also graduated, who took over her project after she left and also started the ovary project and uh, figure out the, the, the ovary granular cell apoptosis is part of an ovary aging program, only partly. And, and, and this has nothing to do with, we believe there are many programs for aging of the ovary, is particularly in the egg, but I, we just don't know what happened there. So I will stop here and, and thank you all for listening and thank you all for your patience to stay here late. Thank you. And uh, somewhat is more like in a philosophical level. So I think everything has a price or consequences. If you want to live young and uh, keep fertilized abilities in an old age, the offspring might be unhealthy as the consequence. So my question is, this, so why this uh, rib 3 is tackled at the uh, seminal vesicle or the ovaries in the mice? And uh, uh, does other organs share the similar pathways or uh, express the similar molecules? Um, very good question. Um, we, test, we tested all the major organs. Um, we didn't see any difference. And uh, the RIP3 normally um, uh, is expressed uh, in the uh, epithelial uh, layers that, that uh, lined our GI tract. Uh, that's why you see the HD29, which is a colon cancer cell, they express RIP3. And also all the immune cells that express RIP3, you know, T cells, B cells, monocytes, you know, they all express RIP3. So in normal situation, you know, RIP3, we believe, is, um, is, a, is a part of the immune system that give up the organ damage signal. So because many bacteria and viruses, they, they carry their own caspase inhibitor. So when they inhibit the host, they want the host to live longer so they can reproduce. And otherwise, the host will trigger apoptosis, then they, they lost their chance. So they, but with, uh, when they inhibit the caspase, the, the GI tract, the immune cells have RIP3. Then if you block caspase, RIP3 come in, they trigger necrosis, they popping the cell open. And then if you cellular content leak out, then your immune system know where there is the infection, there is a problem. And they mobilize you know, all these macrophages, monocytes, you know, the, the immune system to come here and to, 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 to attack. So no, this, this is how they function normally. But in major tissues, and uh, you, let's say you, you take them out, you know, they look fine, until you challenge them with you know, like a dose of virus, and then they cannot handle. But normally, they, are, they look fine. And we look through the brain, you know, long uh, liver, you know, the intestines, intestines, muscle, and they, look, they are no different. Of course, you know, like muscle and uh, liver, and the, the liver is still express rib strip. Like brain express very little rib strip. The lung epithelial also express high level rib strip. And we believe this pathway will play a major role in antiviral that come from respiratory tract. And as a matter of fact, we did the RIP1 inhibitor on the severe, in a severe case of COVID patients. And we see very good results of alleviating the respiratory stress and uh, save the hospital stay. Uh, thanks, Professor Wang's talk. Very wonderful. Uh, I'm wondering uh, whether there are any defects of uh, RIP3 knockout mice, because uh, if I'm cor correct, uh, the RIP3 knockout mice can keep young and uh, can reproduce in uh, orderly time, uh, although the uh, although the, the the newborn pups can have some problems, but overall. Uh, it seems that the benefits are more than the 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 drawbacks. <laughs> Depending on which perspective you <laughs> you are looking at, uh, when they are young, the RIP3 knockout produce normal pops, and when they are old, 
uh, the wild type is no longer able to produce, and they can still reproduce. And then their prophecies all have birth defects. It's not normal. Um, so, but normally we don't keep them that long. And only when you, you know, your project gets scooped, that you have to keep it long to finish up your project, then you keep them that long. Before, nobody keeps them that long. And, uh, you know, that's why it's accidental. And it's, it's, you know, I would say it's irrelevant in a, in, in, in a wild. Uh, in a wild, you know, you want, to, you, you want to eliminate them quickly. And this thing will act active, you know, when, this, when animal get to a certain age, they, they can no longer re reproduce. What's really interesting, you know, I mentioned that now you're asking a little bit, but I didn't go into, is this pathway is not conserved in canine species. Like the, the wolves, the dogs, the, 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 the tigers, the lions, they don't have this pathway. So, you know, we are joking, you know, they, these animals, they don't die, they die young, they don't die old. Um, you know, they fight to death. You know, it's like old Chinese saying, you know, um, you know heroes and beauties die young because they don't want them, people to see them old. OK, and another question is a very general question. Uh, so uh, from the study of uh, uh, how to say, program the cell death in uh, organ-specific aging. Uh, from your understanding, uh, is there any hints that we can, we, we, we can use to uh, slow down the aging process? Well, um, you know, this is another <laughs> philosophical question. Uh, I think scientifically, um, you know, in human, we, we, we don't know. But for mouse, definitely. Uh, I didn't show you the, you know, the, the, the we, we now able to feed these animals, you know, one of the RIP1 inhibitors we have um, for two years. Um, the, animal, the, the animal on normal diet all look very old. You know, two years, two and a half, more than two years old mouse is, more, is like 80 years old human. Uh, they look old, they are, you know, their posture is, you, know, you, you look at them, they are old. But we can keep the same um, littermates on our compounds, looks very young. No difference from two months old. And not only they look young, we even put them into exercises. Roller running, water mates, they all perform just as well. So scientifically, we can. But what price to, is paid, we still, we don't know. We are still studying. And um, because the animal, we don't know. They look young. They could be very, oh, they are not stupid. They are also smart. Uh, they are young, they are lean, they're good looking, they are smart, they, they, they move fast. But they could be other unseen. They're probably not able to survive COVID. Uh, so there's always, there's always a balance, there's always a give and take. But we, we need to understand it. Um, you know, this, this has become real science. Uh, you know, I always, um, you know, I believe you know, we are, you know, aging is just like other physiology. It's just like development. It's just reverse of development. And if we now can understand development at a cellular biochemical level, why cannot we understand aging at a chemical biological level? But if it's just wear and tear, it's, it will be difficult. And now I'm telling you, it's not wear and tear. It's programmed. If it's a program, it's, we can understand. We're not only able to understand it, we may be able to even to interfere. OK. Um, for time's sake, I have one question from the anonymous students on the line. Uh, the question is, 
in the young mouse ovary, does RIP3 also regulate program cell death? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, this is one puzzle we don't understand. In young ovary, it's expressed, and it's, it's, all in, it's also in a, in a granular cell surrounded the egg follicle. But we don't know what's its function. And the RIP3 knockout, clearly they are knockout, they have no, no longer there. The egg function is fine. You, they still produce, you know, puffs. Um, so that is uh, still a mystery for us. We, we don't understand. So RIF3 is involved in both necrosis and apoptosis. So do you think right. there's a reason why evolution choose to use the same molecule in these two very dramatic, dramatically different death pathways? Yes. Um, you know, this is, again, good and philosophical question. Um, we know for a fact they can do that, uh, which I, I didn't go into the molecular details. I even know why, you know, why they choose these two. Like in HeLa cells, you, you can express very high level RIP3. They don't go apoptosis, but they go necrosis. In MCF7 cells, you express same level of RIP3. All the cells get killed by apoptosis. And we believe the reason is, is, is the uh, uh, HSP90 um, chaperone level. If the, if the chaperone level is high, the sudden expression of RIP3 will be folded correctly. And they, after they folded correctly, they are inactive. They have to be active by upstream, you know, adapter proteins and the kinases. But if the, the, the sudden expression and the, also the chaperone is low, the RIP3 will phosphorate itself. They cannot fold it correctly quickly and correctly, and they phosphorate the cell, I, we believe, as a signal for the cell is no longer able to handle all this. And then if you phosphorate that particular site, 164, 165, then it's able to recruit RIP1 and FADD caspase. So there is, a, there is a switching because of the cellular contents, and the cellular contents is chaperone level. Well, that's very interesting. So it could respond to the protein misfolding state. Yes. Too. Yes, protein unfolding state. Correct. Thank you. Shadong, very fascinating talk. Um, so for, I mean, a related question, uh, what, what is the mechanism underlying prostaglandin induced uh, RIP3 uh, increase? It's a transcriptional increase? Transcription. Yes, that is clear. I see. Mm. So, you, so you're saying for RIP3, let's say in young uh, animal versus old, even though the protein are still there in the female case, but uh, the phosphor, I mean, in the, obviously in the young, in the, in the uh, granulocytes, in, they from don't the younger have mice, they're yeah. not, they not phosphorylated, right? Not the proteins are there, but they're, yeah, correct. so you think it has something to do with the chaperone uh, level? We be, we, yes, it's also chaperone. I see, thank you. Mm. And we, because we know it's HSP90 chaperone, we can, now there are lots of HSP90 inhibitors. For time's sake, the last question. And shift with the inhibitor. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. So I have a question about, I think you touched upon the fibrosis and fibrotic tissues, and I know that PGE2 also has a role there as well. So I'm just curious, do you think this uh, MLKL independent uh, RIPK3 pathway is, has some connection in the fibrotic tissues or in fibrosis? Uh, that is a good question. And uh, so far, um, RIP3 clearly can induce apoptosis independently. Whether they can induce necrosis independent of MLKL, uh, at least in the system we look at it, is no. But I also mentioned, like dogs, wolves, tigers, they have no MLKL, but they still have RIP3. So what is their substrates? Do they have MLKL equivalent? 
or do they just don't have any, you know, this male mediated male reprogram aging because they just they die young by fighting, um, and they don't have this MLKL, then they are they fighting they get easily infected and then they die young. Uh, their wound healing does not look good. So there is, but there is also alternative possibility that in these animals there is a MLKL equivalent. But they just don't look like MLKL. The MLKL kill, the MLKL clearly is a late evolved molecule. So it has a kinase like, which is serve as a bonding to its upstream kinase. And it's also N terminus, it's all helix, it's like all helix bundles. So these are the helix bundles that can disrupt membrane. So they have no, don't have a sequence homology. So whether they truly has homolog in these different animals. So we really, we look at, we really want to get our hands on a dog cell line, and we couldn't find any. Does anybody know there's dog cell line? Let me know. A wolf or tiger. Okay, okay. let's thank the Professor Wang for the wonderful and inspiration of talk. Thank you.